Hello everyone and welcome back to another Stratigoy video. Here we are with the GHB analysis part two, grand strategies and battle tactics. This is a standalone video, even though it's a, a sort of a part two, you can definitely follow along without having seen part one. But if you haven't seen it, you should probably go watch it anyway, because it's very entertaining and probably interesting and you'll, you'll hopefully learn something new. Uh, Ryan and I are, are still uh, doing this uh, video series with the two of us. Uh, so Ryan, welcome once again. Thank you very much. Glad to be here, as always. <laughs> um, yeah, Grand Strategies today and Battle Tactics, Battle Tactics. It might be a little bit shorter. If you haven't seen part one, uh, we're doing uh, missions in yet another video, so in part three. But Ryan and I are, are intentionally uh, postponing that video for a little bit longer because we want to practice with the missions before we put it out there. Uh, so uh, still still keep an eye on the channel for part three, but it might be a couple of weeks uh, before you see that one popping up. Okay, grand strategies and battle tactics. Let's see what we're covering here. So um, first of all, we're going to go over every of the six new grand strategies and we'll also do a small conclusion. Then we'll talk battle tactics and finally we'll round off with uh, a, not a separate slide as much, but just a a quick chat between me and Ryan about the impact of the, on, the, on, on the game with those battle tactics and also with the, those grand strategies, but to a lesser extent. Let's start off with the grand strategies though. So the first one is to control the nexus. You need to have two or more friendly wizard units that can be characters or just uh, normal units, wholly within six inches of the center of the battlefield. That in and of itself isn't that hard for uh, complete wizard armies like Lumineth, but for a lot of armies it is totally undoable or at least very, very, very risky. Um, I also feel like Holy Within 6 inches of the center is a pretty small space to keep track of. It's basically an objective and if there's not actually an objective on that middle, uh, middle of the field, being Holy Within 6 can be quite tricky. You need to, you really need to mark that down in a tournament setting just to make sure that you're not losing out on uh, on the whole within part there. How do you feel about this uh, grand strategy, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, obviously, on battle plans that don't have an objective in the middle, maybe it's asking your opponent to kind of have a trade-off yeah. of whether they're holding something or not. Um, you know, I'm looking through the battle plans right now to see how many don't have uh, an objective that's right in the middle. Um, it's around half. Um, so I guess that's something, um, I would, now it doesn't have to be Antorian locus because they're obviously a little bit weaker by implication yeah. or less tanky. I always think of Archeon, but you could also think of like, uh, in soul blight, like a, va um, a vampire Lord and zombie dragon hell, two of them. Mm. Um, and, um, and then just put them in the middle. I, do they both pay a fit on those bases in holy than in the middle i don't know i'm actually sure but you know what i'm saying maybe a vingorian lord or something else that can yeah. kind of tank up keep yeah. healing um i could see a build like that um where if you've got some tanky maneuverable um you know good at defending themselves by fighting back wizards uh that could be a thing and then obviously if you can buffer them by putting <clears throat> a, a big unit around them summoning something around them uh could be a thing but like you said, it's it's dependent on your list. Um, yeah, and in certain missions where the objective is not in the middle, you might actually lose out on points because you have to give up capturing certain objectives. Maybe so that's also, right. especially at the end of the battle, that's uh, it, it. Usually comes down to like one or two points, right? Yeah, and here's my big thing about holier than any point on the battlefield is that um, at tournaments, a lot of times the tables will be set up for you ahead of time. And even if they're really good about not putting terrain inside where objectives are supposed to be, which of course is the rule, it has to be outside of three of the center of the objective, mm -hmm. they might very well put a giant block of terrain right in the middle, which means you can't actually get it. Yeah. And yes. then you're just screwed. You have no control over it. Yeah. So even for for armies that have a ton of wizard units like Lumineth, I feel like this is an avoid. Don't take it. I, it's just too risky. Yeah. 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 Okay. The next one is called spellcasting savant. I love that word, savant. 
the model picked to be your general is an Antorian Locus and has not uh, and has not been slain. So that that's when you complete this battle tactic. Um, from a Lumineth perspective, this is doable, uh, especially if you have some bodyguards around. Um, I feel like for a lot of armies, is actually quite okay. A lot of ar lots of armies will have Andor Antorian Loci um, with this new JHB anyway. Um, and with a new battle scroll uh, change to Lookout, sir, it's hard to snap characters. But still, it's still your general. Um, you know, as you mentioned in part one, Antorian Loci are probably not that tanky because wizards with less than nine wounds and no. Wait, they can't have a mount, but they can be unique. Are usually not tanky, so yeah, it is. It is still a risk. It is still, definitely still a risk. But out of all of them, I like this one uh, quite a lot for certain armies. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's fair. Um, you know, we've had a variant of this that's like your general has to be alive at the end of the at yeah. the end of the the game as grand strategies in a number of books and uh, in GHBs. Um, it's just another one of those. Um, it, I think this is also really going to depend on whether your book has. Uh, good grand strategies or not mm -hmm. and that's that holds for this table in general mm -hmm. um that if you've already got a great one then these whatever who cares but lumineth uh, notably doesn't have that great of grand strategies yeah in the no book. they're terrible and so you're really i i get that those of you out there playing Lumineth are going to be looking at these with like a little bit of a oh boy like these better be good and uh this this like Jonas, you just said Said, I, th I think there is a way to make this one work, but it, it's got a lot of interplay. Yeah. So, and we can get, definitely t turn it off. Before we record this video, you guys, we actually went over all of the grand strategies, and I had, I had made a, um, a separation between good or doable grand strategies and uh, ones that were bad or situational, and we ended up removing that because all of the all of the grand strategies in the GHB are actually very situational and pretty difficult which is a huge change from before where you had an auto default grand strategy and also auto default battle tactics, to be honest. Uh, but I, I feel like you really have to, both during list building and in the game, you really need to keep the grand strategy in mind when you're uh, playing. Definitely. Yeah, which is a good change, I feel. Okay, uh, Slaughter of Sorcery. When the battle ends, no wizard units can still be on a battlefield. It is very important to note it says no wizard units, so that's both your opponents, but also yours. Which is um yeah. Not fun <laughs> if you if you wanted to bring wizards. Uh this just might be an auto loss loss versus Zinj or Lumineth. Uh because how often are you actually killing full uh armies? And you also need to kill your own wizards if you're bringing them. So this is definitely a one that you're only bringing, in my eyes at least, you're only bringing if you have no wizards from the get-go. And even then it's very difficult, it's very risky in certain matchups. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we were talking about it before where one of the scenarios is that both of the opponents have no wizards and they both chose this and then the grand strategy becomes meaningless because you both get it by default mm -hmm. so so then the grand strategy has no meaning there's no six point swing of you getting three and them not getting the three whatever you want to look at it as uh it just goes back to a game without grand strategies at that point um and then trying to kill wizards like i don't like anything where i have to kill everything of everything you know as you'll yeah. see my opinion about it some of the other ones here um, killing one thing, okay, fine. Maybe I can devote enough, dedicate enough resources to killing it. But killing every single one uh, is difficult. Uh, I would say it's also difficult. Um, uh, what, what am I trying to say? Like, if you even if you eat your own wizard up in to combat, now you can't force someone to shoot you, but you can force them to attack you. Mm -hmm. You can't force them to pile in, but you can like run into some. <laughs> if you really want to suicide your own wizard. And you only had like let's say one wizard. Eat that guy up there, and make them fight you. Um, it's maybe doable, but like so, the only army I really seeing this the taking taking this is a non wizards army, and only if they think they've got enough output and maneuverability to go chase down the rest of the win wizards on the table. Yeah. So, and even then, if there are no wizards, it's a pointless grand strategy. Yeah, there are some battle tactics that reward you for charging in with units that then 
possibly die or at least would be it would be okay if they died afterwards so you know it, it wouldn't be the worst case to lose your wizards in turn four and five at a steady pace because then you would probably also guarantee yourself getting some battle tactics but even then that's, that's such a weird uh risk to take <laughs> right for a yeah, full definitely. three points so this this seems like a definite avoid to me even in uh non-wizard armies Okay, Baron Icecape uh, suffers from the same problem that um, Control the Nexus does. So all enemy units with artifacts of power, power uh, need to be destroyed, which is, you know, usually one, maybe two. Uh, and there can be no enemy units within, this, within six inches of the center of the field, which is, I mean, so hard to guarantee, right? Destroying the artifacts in itself is doable. That would be good enough of a challenge by itself, I think, as a grand strategy. Um, but then having no enemy models within six inches of the center of the field, that is difficult. If it would, if it, if it said no enemy is wholly within six inches, then I could see, you know, just you holding the middle to get that grand strategy after you're done killing all the artifacts of power uh, units, but just no enemy units, even when they're just with one inch on that yellow line of your objective marker or your, the, the middle of the board marker, I mean... Yeah. Yeah, killing the artifacts isn't that crazy unless they're on like the tankiest guy because mm -hmm. most armies are trying to be low, so they're only going to have one, maybe two artifacts. Yeah. Exactly. It's not the crazy. Like, in, in contrast to having to kill, every it's just they're not going to have six of these. Yeah. There are armies that have six wizards or more. Yeah. Like if they have wizard units, but no one's got six artifacts. So, yeah. um, yeah. So like I, I think there's definitely a plus there, but again the. It's not quite the same, obviously. It's the opposite. Like, you wanted... To, so, okay, imagine that you're setting up the table, or, like, the table is set up for you at a tournament. The other one, the Control the Nexus, was a problem that you had to be holy within, so if some giant piece was sitting there, you might not even be able to fit your wizard's base holy within. Yeah. Okay, that sucks. Well, this one, imagine that, um, that you have a big enough piece of terrain that you can actually set this up, and, and assuming, of course, that there's no objective in the middle, that you, like, you're at one of these tournaments or you're at home, attack or defender rules, where whoever's the defender gets to set up the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Well, they're just going to set it up so it screws the other person's grand strategy. Yeah. You know, either way. Um, but this one, I'm thinking, like, it might be a little harder, because like you said, it's a lot easier to just toe in to six inches. Yeah, for but sure. I, I just think, because both of these are so reliant on this, I think TOs that are making maps for tournaments need to expressly not put any, not allow any terrain in the middle. Like, yeah. I know that might sound crazy, but, like, on that six, because, just because one-third of the grand strategies in the book that we're all supposed to be tapping from uh, require this. So it's insane if you put terrain in the middle. Yeah. I think it's just really a feel bad. Yeah. 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 I would, I would definitely avoid this as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. On to overshadow. We uh, actually had a disagreement here. Uh, I think you're, you'll be, you'll be, uh, you'll be correct at the end of the show, but uh, I would still like to make an argument for this one. So you Please need do. To so you need to slay all enemy battle line units and have at least one friendly battle line unit from your starting army on the battlefield. Um, my point was that you're, that killing battle line is something that usually happens anyway and you want to do that as well because I would say that a lot of battle line are easier to kill than certain elite units uh, while you actually made the opposite uh, argument which is very interesting so let's, let's talk that out uh, afterwards. Um, and, you know, you having to have one battle line alive is fine. It can also just be one model from your, I don't know, from your tiny unit that, that retreated or something. So that last part is definitely doable, um, though, you know, still up to your opponent, but that's with all the grand strategies. Now there is no clear winner here. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, you could also come up against a list with full Varengar ba Varengard battle line units. And then what? Um... The thing is, if you're if you're looking at all these grand strategies, they're all kind of risky, or just flat out bad. And I'm looking at them from a perspective where there is no better option in your own battle zone, right? So you have to choose one of these. Spellcasting Savant is my favorite from the six, 
But then overshadow is also... I, I think I would rather risk overshadow and then lose my grand strategy automatically against just Varengard lists and a couple of others than taking, for example, Baron Icecape and then just losing because they tiptoed in into six inches of the center of the field. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's risky, but all of them have a very obvious downside. If you're playing against Zinj and you take Spellcasting Savant, you're probably not completing a grand strategy because they have such an easy time killing small wizards. Yeah, I, you're, I mean, you're right that all these are difficult, but I, maybe it's just because I'm playing in a super competitive meta. Yeah, probably. But, like, look, um, there are tons of tanky armies with tanky battle line because 3rd edition books turned on a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Like where where all you have to do is take a general and this thing becomes yes, a battle true, line true. or a sub faction and a lot of people lean that direction. Nightmare gets can be a nightmare because uh, remember they well as long as they don't bring them back. But if on a four up rally with something, you know any army with a four up rally fire slayers a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, corn also um, and for what about things that can teleport? So if I have a cheap unit of tree revs, I just teleport one of them into the corner and as soon as you get anywhere near them. I teleport to the other corner, yeah. which is also a part of a battle tactic. Yeah. So, and if any army has a teleport that they can do without having to rely on casting, um, there you go. Uh, so, I I do agree with you that these are very hard battle tactics, and I do agree that this grand strategies. That's what I mean. Yeah, grand yeah. strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and I do agree that this one against the right matchup is doable. Like you said, trying to kill trying to kill battle line is kind of something that just happens. But remember, you have to kill all of them. And I'm just not a fan of all of them. Yeah. Because then they just take one cheap one and throw it in the corner. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know? And so, uh, you know, if they've got cheap chaff, they just don't use this chaff anymore. Yeah, my idea was with Merciless Blizzard and Horfrost around, even the most elite battle, battle line units are at risk of dying just because minus three Horfrost weapons will eventually slice up something or a merciless blizzard might ev eventually pop even the uh the most tankiest of varengard units though you know they have that spell ignore right yeah 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 uh, i get what you're saying about the rend but uh yeah i mean they can also uh, keep in mind varengard are also save stacking to hell yeah that's true so yeah anyway I, I do agree they're all these are all tough grand strategies. yeah it's, it's not that i'm like a huge fan of this like take this one for uh, for sure but out of all of them if i would uh, advise taking three this would if i had to choose three to take this one would be in the top three for me personally uh even though it's an auto loss against certain armies for sure and i agree with you on that for sure um and then the last one, uh, Magic Made Manifest, that this one would also be in the top three, also, albeit very reluctantly. Uh, you need to have two or more endless spells or incarnates on the battlefield that are controlled or uh, controlled by or bonded to friendly units. Um, I feel like this is achievable for certain armies like um, uh, OBR. They still have that thing, right, where um, their endless spells are much easier to control or no? Uh, yeah, yeah, they have the, their special version of bonding. Yeah. Um, and if you're bringing incarnates, that's probably gonna not going to help you out because you want it to be wild. Um, but it's still super risky with primal magic dice, auto unbinds, null stone, and it's two or more endless spells, which means it needs to be with at least two different wizards, which is tough. I was thinking, like, just put put two of your wizards outside of unbind range and have them pop the endless spells but even then that's needing you to to have two wizards still alive and then them being out of 13 of unbinding so yeah it might be very risky as well um yeah technically seraphon's got a way to control three endless spells with one wizard True. so you could True. you could get away with that yeah um but yeah, seraphon I mean, had great also... grand strategies <laughs> okay yeah um mm -hmm. Also with incarnates, uh, we don't know what the new one's going to be. Obviously, reinforcing that there's going to be a new one because why make a keyword if you're only going to have one unit that it applies yeah. to? Yeah. Um. So I yeah I. The other thing is, and we were talking about this. So like beforehand, if you don't have control over how priority plays at the end of the game, and you go 
first. You have to go first in the battle round. Even if you put up, you've got two endless spells ready to go, uh, that opponent is getting um, a... You, there's, no, there's no interaction you can have for their dispel attempt they get with heroic willpower or anyone else they have in their army that can get rid of spells in their turn. So they just turn it, they just, and then they've got primal dice to get rid of it. Yeah. So if this is basically re hoping that either you get rid of all of their people that can do anything about those, maybe that you have three endless spells or a combination of endless spells and incarnates. Remember, I think you can only ever take one incarnate anyway. So you have at least three, so you have some redundancy. So it's two after they get rid of one. Um, you know, I don't know. It just seems like this is really putting you. It's a, it comes up to a 50 50 chance or less than, uh, depending on what they end up getting, you know, uh, at the end that last round. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, if I were playing this grand strategy, I don't know. I would hope, in, and then I didn't finish the game. I would hope that my opponent said, oh, we can just call it. <laughs> you know and we could just call it and they forget that this could deny yeah. me my three points yeah. you know yeah uh, yeah i mean you all you probably also have to take at least three in the spells just to make sure that two out of two out of three go off yeah and then I if mean, you, please 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 sorry yeah and then if your opponent brings the parts of null dust you're like oh fuck okay i guess i'll don't get my grand strategy this time yeah yeah and then, like, I mean, so, like, as someone who's playing with the, was playing with the techless list with three endless spells to mm -hmm. try to guarantee that battle tactic, I thought that was hard enough as a battle tactic. Yeah. But this is at the end of the game, which is basically either you already had stuff floating around and they couldn't get rid of it. Yeah. Or you, um, you put it all down on the last turn as much as you can, or the last two turns or so, and then it's basically just that battle tactic again. Now... You could technically move the endless spells out of uh, dispel range. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah. So you could push it as if it's predatory. Just keep yeah. sending it into the corner, yeah. and that could be a thing. So maybe. Yeah, I feel I, these grand strategies are are designed well enough to be very challenging, and, and it actually moves us to our conclusion slide for the grand strategies here. Um, so they they really need, require you to plan more, especially in comparison to. Um, other GHBs, where certain ones were just auto-includes or default choices. Um, but it just makes the comparison to Battle Tome um, Grand Strategy so much bigger, right? And so much more impactful. Having good Battle Tax is, is already very strong, and then having good Grand Strategies on top of that in your Battle Tome might be very good. Or is, is, is not might be, but is very good. Um, be, because all these Grand Strategies are so situational. And you really need to consider your Baltom Grand Strats first because there are no obvious picks here. I personally really love um, spellcasting Savant. It's it's fine. Uh, I like to keep my general alive anyway. Um, and if they do end up killing him or her, then I still have the reprisal battle tactic that I can complete to balance it out a little bit. Um, but yeah, other than that, I didn't. I don't really think I would like to pick. A different one. I was playing against my Stormcast buddy uh, two days ago, and he had to pick one of those grand strategy grand strategies from the GHB because he didn't bring enough dragons to complete the ones from his own battle tome. And he was like, "Wow, all of these are really bad." <laughs> yeah. Um, and he didn't. He did end up uh, completing Overshadow. Lo and behold, he actually killed all my battle line. But you know, Lumineth battle line is super squishy, so they do end up dying. And I didn't bring any Sentinels, so it was just all melee battle line it turned out well for him but yeah as you mentioned it could have just as well been a different uh, different army or different battle line choices and then against sylvaneth it, there were there was no reason that he would have there was no way that he could have completed that grand strategy yeah so if you're thinking about armies that don't have or if, if you either they don't have wizards are you what do you want uh, that you choose an army that either doesn't have wizards at all in it yeah. like by choice or mm -hmm. like and or you're forced to not mm -hmm. uh because you don't have access to them if you look at these grand strategies there's only uh you can't do control the nexus you can't do spellcasting savant you can do slaughter of sorcery but again like i said if the other armies like that then it's, yeah super uh, crazy it's, it's, um uh and then you can't do magic made manifest because currently we only have one incarnate mm-hmm so 
there you go. You know, like half of these are gone just by not taking a magic arm. So, I don't yeah. know. It's it's pretty rough. Yeah. It's a rough time if you have bad uh, battle tome grand strats. That's yeah. for sure. Okay, speaking of battle tome stuff, let's move on to the uh, battle tactics because these have also um, these have also been reworked completely. Personally, I'm a huge fan of the current selection. It kind of rewards you for being a uh, wizard, though. So a, a lot of them. But the opposite side of those battle tactics are very aggressive battle tactics that reward non-wizard units usually. So I, I really like the mix that they've, they've got in here and there's no super clear, very easy turn one battle tactics like it, there was with the um, beginning of the GHBs. What was it called? The one where you just ran your monsters? Yeah, yeah. Uh, pum -pum -pum advance or something. Ferocious advance, maybe. Yeah, ferocious advance. I mean, that was like such a, such a silly thing. Um, there's none of that in the, in here. So let's start off with uh, Intimidate the Invaders. You have to have more friendly units wholly outside of your territory than in your territory. Uh, this tactic is very easy to complete uh, by just moving. There's really nothing your opponent can do against that. Uh, you mentioned this as a if you're playing a, a non-castle army as a tactic that's very easy to do in turn one. Um, as a castle army, I feel like it's something that you might, might probably grab around turn three or four uh, if you haven't done it before that. But, you know, at, let's say, especially at turn three or four for any army, it should this should be something that you complete at some points during your game. Yeah, so the there are a couple things I noticed from my game so far. Uh, first off, the wholly outside versus just in your territory. Remember, that's a big difference. Mm. So if you've got a if you've got a single model that's touching your territory, um, they count as in your territory. Yeah, they don't count as wholly. So obviously, so that you have to be totally outside. And depending on how big the territories are, obviously, that could make a big difference. Um, and if someone really wants to turn this off and say like one of those missions where they can delete objectives, they start. They need to start deleting objectives that are in their territory so that you don't have any choices. You have to be in your own. Yeah. Um, so if it, you want to do this one earlier than later, if I were you, uh, but of course you, a lot of people can't do it right off the bat. Uh, the second thing that's interesting, and I saw this later, and another reason to do it earlier, is my opponent in one of my games had his wizard that I needed to kill. There was an objective in the very middle of the board, and he had, and, and that was part of my territory. And he had like a wizard standing just inside my part, where if a, if I were to kill this guy, I would have had to charge him and be within a half inch, and there was no way with the size of my unit I was going to be able to not have a single footprint of any model in my territory. So it turned off that battle tactic for me at the end of the game. Like, mm -hmm. there was nothing I could do if I wanted to go grab that objective. Yeah. So, it, there's some tactical play you can kind of do with this one if your opponent hasn't used it yet. So, I, I would definitely suggest trying to get it over with as soon as possible. Like you said, with my Techless Castle build, uh, this is something I couldn't have expected, especially with certain battle plans. Yeah, for sure. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, Reprisal. Uh, so your your general has to have died, and then you get to the, you need to destroy that unit that killed your general. Um, I like the idea of this. It is very important to, to keep track of who killed your general, though, who dealt a killing blow, because for in my game, for example, we weren't actually sure which unit did the last wound because my general was surrounded by three units, and I was like, was it Indrasta or was it your dragons or? What was it? <laughs> it was like, I have no idea. <laughs> um, so I didn't end up completing this one, but it is, it is now important to keep track of that. Um, it, the, the, the downside is it requires your general to die. And that, yeah. that is really bad. <laughs> so yeah, if, you, if you're completing this, you're probably already a little bit disappointed that your general is dead. There's an FAQ that we might need for this because um, what happens if an endless spell kills your general? You can't kill an endless spell. Oh, wow. And I don't think, based I was trying to do a quick read to see if I could find it. 
I don't think the controlling player of the endless spell or the summoner counts as the person who did it. So it's in, in, in a similar example, if you die from battle shock, but not from like if your unit gets destroyed from battle shock, but not from the attacks that caused the battle shock, yeah. that that doesn't count. We know that. Yeah. So if that's ruled that way, I would also say the in the spell might very well be um, neutral. You know, neutral. Yeah. And then and then there's no way to get reprisal. Yeah. Or what you want to do if you're trying to kill someone's general is kill them with the hardest to kill thing you have. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so what yeah. I like about this uh, tactic, though, is that it it is the first time that it, that any rule is referring to a friendly general, not your chosen general. Oh, yeah. That's so that good. that means that a war master that's, that's, that got killed also counts for this battle tactic. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah. Um, so what you obviously want to do too here is don't kill someone's general if you can help it until the end of the game. Yeah. You know, if you know, then they they're denying them one of the battle tactics. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you're obviously a determined player here, but I feel like this is something that you're you'll just take it in strides. I feel like if if you get the chance to destroy a general and usually generals are important units, isn't isn't that worth it compared to a battle tactic? It depends on what they're doing. Some yeah. armies just take a general to turn on a turn on a, a battle line unit, and they don't even give them like they've got the commentary, but whatever. Yeah, that's fair. You know, so it really depends on what they're carrying. If they're a linchpin for the army, of course you want to get rid of. Them. Yeah. And then just do it with your hardest to kill unit. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the next one. I hate this one simply because I. <laughs> I mean, who chose the name of this? Good Lord, Endless Expropriation? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God damn. So uh, you, you get to pick one enemy unit that summoned an endless spell that is on the battlefield or that is bonded or an enemy unit that is bonded to an incarnate. Destroy that unit or have the incarnate be wild. So this is one that was rephrased with the FAQ. It's much more clear now and also a little bit harder to complete, I guess. Um, no, sorry, easier to complete, right? Easier, um, I think. No, I, I, it, making that endless spell, um, you could you used to be able to steal an endless spell. That was definitely one of the things. So Kairos or someone else that could yeah. steal it, that that would be good. And then and it's it used to also be if it went wild, which you could do with that spell. That's the ten cast spell. Yeah, uh, because realm. now you can have your incarnate be wild, but you don't actually have to kill the character that was controlling it before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it works well with the rupture spell. Uh, it might be a very small reason to ever cast it. Uh, even though if you've watched part one, you already know that ne neither me or Ryan are, are big fans of that spell. Uh, I feel like this is doable in a lot of battles because I think a lot of people will be bringing endless spells because they're just so good. Um, but it requires some planning once again. It's just something that you'll, you'll bump into like, oh, I am actually... This, this actually is actually prone to dying uh, and it's controlling endless spell. So I'll probably complete this, this battle tactic now. But I don't think it's going to be one that you're never completely, completing. I, I actually think this, this might come up in your games quite often. Uh, yeah, what, what I found is a problem here is the same thing you said about who kills your general, which is usually a big enough moment that you remember it. <laughs> oh, yeah. But this one is who summoned an endless spell. <laughs> yeah. And I can tell you right now, as people using predatory endless spells, almost everyone forgets who's officially controlling that endless spell, unless it's super obvious. That's so true. And so you've got to take good notes, or else they like they don't remember. Like you should point it out when it happens every single time it happens to keep track of who's got what. I mean, if, if they if trouble. they don't remember it, as a TO, how would you rule that? I would almost be inclined to say, okay, then your opponent gets to choose which units control it. So yeah, I mean, that, that is good to protect yourself as the person playing with endless spells. Uh, make it very clear, you know, mm -hmm. um, this, so that no one's going to argue about it. Yeah, because they, otherwise they, they, you can forget it on purpose and just to right. protect yourself from this spell, uh, this exactly. battle tactic. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So more bookkeeping. And generally speaking, I find more bookkeeping in a game heavy with bookkeeping already hard enough. Yeah, I don't like it either. But uh, flavor-wise, it's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea is very cool. Uh, speaking of cool ideas, I also love Magical Dominance, even though it's super hard. <laughs> uh, 
so you uh, you need to cast at least one spell with a friendly wizard, and you you can't have any of your spells be unbound this turn. Very very risky if you're in range of being unbound, but it's a very nice turn one battle tactic if your opponent is not within range from one of your wizards and you're a castle army anyway. Uh, it's actually it's actually quite okay. My my friend who played Stormcast against me did a super cool thing. He teleported his um, one of his wizards to the corner of the field with his prayer, then had that wizard cast a spell in a corner where I could not unbound it, and then stopped casting for the rest of the phase. And I thought it was such a neat little trick because he has such a hard time completing battle tactics from his battle tome, and I, I thought it was very clever. Yeah. As a similar thing happened in one of my tournament games, uh, my Sylvaneth player just chose, opponent chose to just cast one spell, yeah. which I think you're referencing on the, yeah. and so sometimes that's, like he auto, he forced it out with, you know, extra dice or whatever, yeah. and then and then there you go. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's doable. Um, it does require to require you to make some sacrifices usually in your spell, in your magic phase, or in your voice phase, sorry, uh, and force you maybe to reduce your casting for a turn. The, the thing is, there's tons of armies that have wizards, but it's not like the pin of their army. Lumineth yeah. is obviously an, an exception. Yeah. That's not what yeah. you would be doing. Yeah. But like, like I get Skaven spells are okay, but they're not amazing. So like, you know, put a, 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 a like put a regular Mystic Shield on someone when you're like, like you said, turn one. Turn one's a great time to do this. Mm -hmm. So for sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think if I was. If I was planning on winning a game, on actually just winning games in tournaments, and you obviously go over all your battle tactics and plan on which tactics you can do each turn, this would be in my top. In, this would be in my top three for turn one battle tactics for most armies. Yeah, for my KO list, obviously it had no way yeah, of doing. No, it, so of course. This, yeah. 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 Okay, uh, magical mayhem is very very uh, akin to a seraphon battle tactic. You get to pick one enemy uh, unit on a field, and you need to destroy it with a spell or the abilities of an endless spell. Arcane Bolt enthusiasts, unite! <laughs> because there's actually not that many armies that have um, aggressive spells, as in uh, killing spells. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's good for Seraphon, it's good for Zinj, because those armies are two prime examples of uh, armies that have um, spell slinging. As a as a weapon, but so I, I mean, for example, Lumineth. Outside of Teclis, there is not a lot of spells that you have that can actually deal damage apart from Arcane Bolt. I think you have one with uh, Overwhelming Heat, and that's it. Yeah, twisting, um... twisting uh, the the connecting tether from the um, uh, from the wizard, from the two cast wizard maybe, but then that's still very very unlikely. You obviously have the Merciless Blizzard now. But that's risking itself. You've got the one that draws like a line and then hits everything. Oh line. yeah, yeah. From, yeah. And then you got the uh, the calibrate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this actually needs an FAQ too, because um, it says it can count if it's the ability as an endless spell, but horror ghast. So hear me out on this. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> the thing about horror ghast is we know that like. Not being able to do inspiring presence is not what killed you. It's that you failed your battle shock. Yes. Fine, but it adds D three. And what if those D three are just what you needed? D three units that run. What if that's what kills the unit? Mm -hmm. And I think horror ghast might be ruled as having killed you. It's risky, right? Because what if unless they like if they have three that need to run and you need to roll five plus. But it does. You don't have to pick. Oh, you do have to pick the enemy unit. But let's say you didn't kill them with your other magic stuff, and you also get horror ghast up there. Does that count? I'm inclined to say that if the D3 make them is what pushes them over yeah, the edge, then it counts. Yeah, I would counts. too. Yeah. Um, but the battle shock itself is definitely not. So if if the amount that they were going to have to lose, no matter how many you made them run, uh, then I, I don't think it would count. But yeah. I don't know. So. Let's know, GW. Let's know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, then on to the less magical inclined battle tactics. Um, bait and trap, this one is very cool, I, I think. Uh, retreat two or more friendly units and make a charge move with two or more friendly units. I love it. It's so cool. Um, it really requires you to change up the battlefields, which I like. It's, it's one of those tactics that, I mean, 
maybe you were at retreating uh, planning on retreating those units anyway but even even if you were it's just such a switch switcheroo with what's in combat that i always love uh the idea of seeing this being executed i feel like yeah. this one is very easy to execute when the stars align but you can also plan for it quite easily right well, this is actually one of the best ones for KO, not to make everything yeah. about KO, yeah. but we are obviously talking a lot about Lumina too. Of course. One of the reasons why this is so good for KO is that if something's in the boat and the boat retreats, everything in the boat counts as retreating too. Mm -hmm. So then you got two and you can do a retreat and shoot. Yeah. So you're not losing as much as you think. Yeah. And keep in mind my Sky Wardens, yeah, when they're, they're in combat, charges. They... well, no, not, not only that. But yeah, so everything in the boat, so that gives you two units. Mm -hmm. But also, at the end of the combat phase, Sky Wardens on a two-up must retreat, and they do D3 mortal wounds on the way out, and it still counts mm -hmm. as retreating. Yeah. So, and there's also things that think about, like, Furies. I think Furies still work this way in Slaves of Darkness. Instead of activating, they can choose to retreat. Same with Skaven. Skaven heroes can choose to retreat instead of uh, fighting on, on activation. Yeah. So, so you can actually... Uh, trigger it in all kinds of ways that are kind of interesting and while keeping a unit pinned so they can't redeploy. Yeah. So there's, I love this one. I think this one's great. And it's, uh, yeah, of course, I, I've got to play some armies that benefit from it. But but uh, I, I still think it's interesting, like you said, to change up the board state. This is one of those tactics that you can do with, with any army, even if you don't have wizards. I just feel like if I were Korn, I don't actually know all the battle tactics from the Korn battle zone by heart. But if I were Korn and I knew that I could not do a lot of these battle tactics because I just don't have any wizards. And now I have to do bait and trap and lose my ward save because I need to retreat. Oh yeah. <laughs> that feels bad, man. <laughs> but that's only on that's only on demon units, yeah. to be fair. Yeah. And then only in outside of eight. Yeah. So they probably don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that's interesting about corn is they have that movement, the murder lust that allows them move into Yeah, and doesn't, and doesn't they, count as a charge, right? Doesn't count as a charge. So also if someone pulls that stupid garrison rule and enters a garrison building and then is in, finds themselves in combat, that also doesn't count. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, so there's some there's some interesting like in an interplays here. Mm -hmm. Great time to be a rules lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> okay. Let into the maelstrom. Uh one more for uh switcheroos. Uh, have one or more heroes and one or more battle line units each make a charge move and at least one of those units must be within three inches of an enemy unit at the end of the turn. So you basically need to have your opponents survive the battle and you as well with one of those units and one of theirs. This one I love because it re requires a lot of planning and knowing how much damage your units will do on average. I charged him with, with uh, Severeth, and Severeth is terrible in close combat, and I just knew he was never going to kill a Stormcast hero um, uh, in close combat. And it's funny because you get that situation where my opponent actually wanted his hero to die, <laughs> so I would fail this battle tactic, so he's not using all-out defense and that kind of stuff to, uh, to mm -hmm. do that, and I'm not using all-out attack to improve uh, Severeth's effectiveness. Yeah. I love these kind of battle tactics that, that change up the way that you think about your units in the game. Yeah, it's interesting what you say, like, from someone who's trying to predict expected values of, of um, you know, uh, I would mainly try to be charging into something that I, I'm not worried about dying from, like you were referencing, but yeah. also that it's not going to die either. Yeah. Um, and then the, 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 I think that the, the tricky one for some armies is that a, a, a hero has to charge. Yeah. Because heroes, heroes can be taken down pretty easy if you don't have the right kind of hero. Um, mm. Fortunately, the game has been focusing on these a lot of these power pairs where if a, a lighter, smaller hero goes in, they can let their like power pair unit yeah. fight right afterwards. So yeah. that could be a good thing. Um, I feel like yeah. you'll see this one pop up between uh, where where there's just duels between small wizard heroes that you're taking for the Antorian Locus anyway. Yeah. And wizards are like a wet towel fights between t the two of them. So I would happily charge my Cathalar into a different wizard and just have them cry <laughs> yeah. uh, to each other and like, no, I'm going to slap you with my staff. Okay, no, I guess I missed. No D3 damage for me. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, I definitely did this one pretty much in every mission. Yeah. So. Um, okay, and then the last one, Surround and Destroy. 
Um, also interesting, we chatted about this one quite a lot before this video actually. Um, so pick three different friendly units on the fields. Have each of those units be wholly within six inches, wholly within, very important, um, of a different battlefield edge, edge. And two or more of those units must be wholly outside of your territory. So you could place one in your own zone and then two need to be outside of your territory. You actually mentioned a, a very important thing that you can just drop a unit in a corner and that's already two battlefield edges so you could choose which one that you want you wanted to count as for um, each of those two units yeah each yeah. one can choose a different one yeah yeah, yeah. uh I, this is super strong with teleports of course teleports are always great but with this battle tactic specifically i just see the the stonks as uh, the internet would say for um tree revenants go up and up with all these battle tactics yep uh, this is really hard for armies that have very big blocks of slow moving guys or yeah. regular foot infantry. If they go to the middle, lure them to the middle, and then this battle tactic is very likely gone if you can keep them there. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, turning off as many of these battle tactics as possible. It's something I definitely saw at this most recent super competitive tournament was that people were starting to kind of like freak out about, I don't have battle tactics left. You know, even for armies with recent books, which most of them were, um, you start to kind of say, oh, this is getting this is getting a little rough. And I there, this might make actually the, all of the world of a difference here if, if one or two of these doesn't end up going through. So, um, but yeah, the big thing to remember, though, is that if you do do the edge, that the holy outside uh, is a big part of that. So that also depends on there. Are, there are probably some ba battle plans where the edges aren't in there. Like, for example, the, the ones where uh, as in like the corners, I mean, the corners aren't part of their territory. Um, oh, it just has to be wholly outside of your territory. Then that would work. So you always have two free ones. Um, in any case, I guess. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. In certain missions, this is going to feel like a sacrifice that you have to be willing to make. Because moving those units towards the edges if you have no teleport sometimes means that you're losing them forever. I um, yeah. I moved my uh, my twins uh, Alania and Elthor to kill a wizard there and complete my battle tactic, but then they only moved six inches. I didn't have speed of fish nearby, and they couldn't for life them teleport and or roll under their uh, turn number because there was nothing to fight with. So I yeah. spent the the last two and a half turns just walking them to the middle. Right. That yeah. That's too bad that didn't go off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that is, that is something that you have to keep in mind, as you mentioned, especially with big units. Um, sometimes it might feel like, the, oh, this is a battle tactic I at least can guarantee to complete. But if you have to move your units away from the center or from the places that you want them to be later on, that might cost you in the end. Yeah. Which it actually did for my opponent. He, uh, he left a, a block of 10, I don't know what they're called, something, something tours. <laughs> um liberators or whatever yeah, sure, sure. um and he he didn't really use them for the rest of the game because they're just so slow yep yep so this they this can't... this might be a bait sometimes this is i mean oh this well actually this is great for uh my my favorite night Z oh yeah gc thing <laughs> there's still some value there she's still going strong the night zephyros a little bit he better be i bought two of those those dudes <laughs> Okay, so in conclusion, um, we both feel like there's no easy turn one battle tactics for certain armies. Okay, sure, there will be from this list, but for mo for a lot of them, there there won't be. And almost all of these are difficult, or at least require a lot of planning, just like the, the uh, grand strats. Having no wizards in your army is going to set you back if your battle tome has bad battle tactics. I really could tell from my battle against Stormcast where he could not complete any of his battle tactics and I had my um, belt, easy battle tactics from uh, Lumineth. It was such a different bit battle. For him it was the uphill the entire way and for me it was like, oh, I guess I'll cast four different spells with four, uh, four different units and oh, I guess I'll kill a unit and conserve my Aether Cords. <laughs> and he was like, oh, I have to move this 480 point unit to the edge of the field to just complete a battle tactic. 
Yeah, so I mean, you were setting this up in the frame of having no wizards, but he, like as you said, he did have a wizard. I think yeah. with Stormcast, it's just so bad already yeah. that it doesn't matter with, I mean, wizards, you need to put a wizard in there just to make for those yeah. two that you're going to Yeah, that was actually, that was actually the point I was in, I, yeah. um, making and I completely forgot it halfway through making that point. But if he didn't have any, if he hadn't ha have had a wizard, we wouldn't have pl had to play the game because it would have right. been so difficult for him to complete anything. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. So yeah, um, just as the earlier analysis that we did with uh, the, the earlier GHB, um, we always try to summarize which kind of units that you need to focus on. And I think the first one is always going to be in this list. Uh, fast units, as always, are very, very important. Uh, preferably with teleport for the um, the, last, the last battle tactic we uh, ref referenced. But also, if, you're, if you end up thinking about going for let's say control the nexus or something like that, or um, Baron Icecape, uh, having a teleport to get to that middle and zoning your opponent or getting into that middle yourself is, is very important. Um, small heroes are also good, uh, preferably if they're, uh, if they're wizards, or especially if they're wizards, I mean. Um, and units with strong unbinds are going to be very good, not to, not to uh, take your own battle tactics or win your own battle tactics, or complete your own battle tactics. That's the verb I was looking for. But to, mm. to, to especially uh, deny your opponent their battle tactics, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, there's only two that are... Well, I guess if they have magic-related ones in the book. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I having a strong unbind... I'm trying to think about how many non-wizards have strong unbinds, though. You know, priests are good at getting rid of endless spells, but... Uh, I don't know. I think the primal magic dice do so much of that heavy lifting anyway mm -hmm. that just having a wizard is impl implicitly doing that for you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Or or that null stone adornment that you that you like the first one uh, mm -hmm. is kind of important if you have no unbinds other than that because you you need to be able to um, deny your opponent those two middle uh, battle tactics, right? Right. It's twenty five percent of the options that he has from the GHB. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let's quickly remain on this slide for the last topic of this video, and that's the impact that this this GHB or this uh, these battle tactics and these grand strategies are going to have on the game. Um, is there anything that r pops into your head right away now, Ryan, after having played a tournament with this book already? Um, what's some what what's one of the biggest differences that that you've noticed? from the from the previous ghb um i think the ghbs continue to get uh more dialed in to kind of going in two different directions um if you think back to like about a year ago people were really complaining about the inequity between armies that had book grand strategies and, and battle tactics and those that did not yeah. haves and have nots yeah. and of course that's fair because like second edition books uh only had them if they had a white dwarf update and blah 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 and a lot of people weren't allowing them at tournaments now we've gotten to the point where every army but cities and feck has a book now um, so that's no longer really a problem, and I haven't played a tournament in a long time where you, you couldn't use them. So in a sense, GW's kind of been pushing us um, like towards those, and I know people have problems with those, those book ones because then you have to kind of be aware of everything that your opponent has. Like in my last tournament, this tournament here, I... Um, I had like I, I try to play super fair, especially with my friends, and you know whatever. Uh, it wasn't worlds, so um, there was a moment where we were kind of talking out how a turn was going to go, and I knew I well I didn't know my opponent's battle tactics that well and didn't think about all of them. And by doing one particular move, I accidentally gave my opponent one of his battle tactics back. Hmm. just to get like an extra point and we talked about it because we were friends and he was like okay well you don't have to do this one we can have a one and one extra point difference so that you i can give to you and i'm like no it's my fault for not looking at all of your battle tactics and i think because they're starting to get a little harder um you definitely want to be picking armies that and this kind of sucks if your army doesn't have good ones but you want to be picking armies that can at least do a reliable number of them yeah and and one of the things that's crazy is an, a few of the books, not all of the books, but a couple of them have a grand strategy that says that you have to do 
at least four of your battle tactics from your own army's battle tactics. And I actually sincerely this time thought about doing it for KO. Okay. Because the KO the KO book ones are reasonable. Um, I, I I don't know. I don't think it's the right move because you can't do a single one outside of your own book. That means you have to do five if you want to get full points out of your own six grand strategy or battle tactics. Hmm. But I, I'm starting to think as these get increasingly harder, especially with the grand strategies, that that's actually looking like an option, um, which is kind of interesting. I, I don't know if it's good for the health of the meta. I don't know. But like in general, I feel like like before I wrote all of my or before I went to this tournament, I wrote down literally every single one of the grand strategies that's available to KO and every one of the battle tactics, and then wrote my opinion of every single one of them. And I think I'm, this is going to be a new practice I do every tournament I go to, and then sit this before submitting my list and say, let's have a come to Jesus moment. Is this actually realistic? And because otherwise you're just shooting yourself in the foot. There's no, yeah. like you said, there's no uh, eye for an eye anymore. There's no run with three dragons, you yeah. know? Yeah. So our three monsters. So anyway, that's a, a little rambly, but like, I, I think it gets to the heart of maybe my early impression of kind of the direction we're heading. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I was also going to say um, that the discrepancy between good grand strategy battle tomes and bad grand strategy battle tomes is just getting bigger which is in contrast to all the other positive stuff that I have to say about these GHBs because I feel like the character of the GHBs is getting much more clearer. The The first one that was all about monsters just feel a little bit, little bit weird. Uh, it, it almost felt like a, a side grade of the core rules, not, a, not, a, not specifically a, a upgrade or a big change. And this one is really, you know, walking a fine line between, okay, we're still... You, you get to have your new toys and your new battle tactics as wizards, but there's also a big downside because they're going to get killed much more often. People are going to hunt for them, specifically with even in name with the um, with the battalion, with the wizard hunting battalion. Um, so that idea identity of the GHB, this GHB is much more clear to me than the first than the, the previous ones. Um, but I do wish that they kept the. I mean, the battle tactics discrepancy between battle tome and GGB is fine to me because there are just a lot of them anyway. But the grand strategy one weighs on me a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel that. I mean, Lumineth is, uh, despite being one of the, you know, not super old books, I wouldn't say it's the newest ones, but it, it was like September. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's got notably bad grand strategy. But mm. uh, sometimes you see that some books will have good grand strats but bad battle tactics and vice versa i actually think luminous got some solid battle tactics oh so yeah for sure for sure there's at least that yeah so yeah yeah but all in all i think i'll uh, i'll have an enjoyable time with this uh this ghb and i, I also like this for a full year and obviously there will be some sm small changes with the battle scroll and with further faqs but uh, i think Playing for a year in for for most people that do that play this hobby is much more realistic than every half a year. Yeah, and like you start to see all the people out there that refuse to buy the product, and yeah. I get it. You know, I I get it. It's expensive, and I come from a, a place of privilege that I've been able to buy as much as I've been able to buy. But at the same time, I just I just feel like. I, GW needs to do what it can to kind of encourage people to all buy in instead of like more people to start to get kind of like, oh, GW is just a, a money hungry company. You know, mm -hmm. I know that they are on their own level, but like I, I always like I know people who expressly only buy from GW stores because they want to support the store. Yeah. I actually feel I don't. So that's where I sit on. I draw a line, I guess. But, um, you know. It's to each their own, but I like that we're heading back in a more reasonable direction. I'm just fingers crossed, hoping they don't ner uh, nuke all of the battle tomes going into fourth edition like they did with 40k twice now, where they just you know release an index and then and then uh, all the books become invalid. But you know we'll see. It's possible. Yeah. Question okay. for you though. Mm -hmm. Question before we move on though, because obviously we big piece that we haven't talked about is the, the missions, but just. In short, because we've covered most of the wizardy kind of stuff and and all that, we've seen that GW is integrated, like we were talking about at the beginning, and by moving things outside of battalions even, they've integrated some of the GHB temporary rules into the core rules. Yeah. 
um, to help us kind of get closer and closer to something that feels good for everyone at all times. Like they're keeping the stuff we like. Yeah. What do you What do you see from this season before we play? You know, with, with just kind of like foresight. What do you think they they might integrate into the rules that we see specifically as new material in this book? Oof, that's a great question. Um, I don't think they'll keep anything from this book because it's such a distinctive uh, identity, as I mentioned before. Like not being able to target heroes in a certain way was an obvious one and i always expected them to change that down the line i i didn't think they would change it this soon but i expected them to change it maybe in for the fourth fourth edition yeah um the primal magic die system is super cool in as an idea uh, i just think it changes the the hero face so much that it's probably too much of a change to to keep any form of that into um, into uh, the core rule sets. So, if, but if you had to pick one thing that's new, what would you say that they're going to keep? You have to. Mm. I think it'd be cool to to get some more generic spells other than Arcane Bolt and Mystic Shield. And obviously you have Ghost Mist and Flaming Weapon, but that you, I've, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen someone play with Ghost Mists on my tables i've seen it online but not on my table I, I i think i would love some more generic offensive spells for example hmm. yeah i'm starting to think that if i if i had to pick one thing from i'm looking through them right now one thing that's unique to this edition i think it might be giving armies that totally don't have a certain type of unit access to a thing so in this particular case, it's Nullstone Adornments. Maybe it won't still be that, like if you have absolutely no way to cast a spell, but something, some, it could be generically like this. If you intentionally restrict yourself, you get an extra bonus. Yeah. Uh, I, could, I could see that becoming a type of unique enhancement that you get access to. Um, so like, for example, giving someone an extra unbind or like, or that CP ability, where like an Antor, you could either choose an Antor yeah, Locus, cool. Locus or, or or if you go second, you yeah. get a thing. Yeah. I, I I think that could that kind of thing could stay. Uh, but I, I agree with you. I don't think Primal Dice are staying. They're definitely we'll they're definitely uh, dialing in on balancing out going second. Yes. Uh, and I feel like they're almost almost at that point where it's it's in perfect balance, or it's as perfect as it can be. Yeah, especially with the battle plans, which yeah. of course we haven't referenced yeah. yet. There's so many good advantages I'm, going I'm second. thinking of the battle plans specifically here, but I, obviously we, yeah. we can't talk about them right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, okay. So that's the end of the video, guys. Um, that was part two. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I had a tremendous time, Ryan. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I always learn a lot, not only by reiterating my own opinion, but by hearing yours, having this conversation about it. Uh, I ho hope you all, all of you and also you, Ryan, learned something new or maybe got some new uh, insights. Uh, please uh, like it if you did. Uh, leave a like, um, leave a comment, um, share it around, maybe even subscribe to the channel and follow us in the Discord uh, where you can chat with me, Ryan, and a bunch of other very cool and very nice people. Let us know in the comments uh, what, what kind of battle tactic that you really enjoyed or something that you maybe as an answer to Ryan's question, you think they'll keep in, a, in the core rule set from this GHB. Uh, yeah. I uh, always love to hear your uh, or read your insights. And don't forget, we're almost at 2,000 subscribers. This video might be the one that pushes us over. It might uh, be. It might be. I hope it's... Applicable enough. Yeah, I hope it's, uh, it's part one already, but who knows? Who knows? Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll definitely see you for part three, although that will be a bit further down the line. See you all and bye-bye.